Boy, you must think that Greg is losing his mind. Couldn't think of two names this morning. It's, it's surprising because David and I had already talked about the graduates, didn't we, David? And it was on my mind, but I sure messed up their names. <laughs> but that happens. Tonight I want to talk about life-changing events. I imagine if we were to just open it for a discussion, each of us would have two or three things that's happened to us in our lives, by our family, by in-laws, things that took place that we were left not the same. Sometimes they're good. And I know there's sometimes they are not so good. But let's emphasize the good. People that come into our lives. Can you name two or three real quick on the top of your mind? How about when you got married? You know, Ronnie was a man that bought auto parts at Pollard Chevrolet where I worked. And we got to be friends and we would do things together. And it began or continued by him asking me to a gospel meeting at Anderson Street Church of Christ back in 1973. There was a young lady there. She was the preacher's daughter. And that didn't scare me off. We started dating. Yes, let me tell you, that changed my life. Her dad taught me the gospel. I was baptized. Shortly after that, married. Shortly after that, about two years, Bob Kaiser, her daddy, said, Craig, would you think about going to school, Brown Trail School of Preaching? You talk about life changing. Yeah. How about other events in your life? Ernie Christie was a preacher in Eastland, Texas. He was the director of the summer camp at Lake Cisco Christian Camp. And we were living at Lipan, and he contacted me. He said, Greg, we need a counselor. Would you consider coming to be a part of our camp? That's the beginning of a delightful journey with many, many young people at Lake Cisco Christian Camp, Camp Red Oak Springs near Newton, Oklahoma, excuse me, Newton, Texas, and up at Lawton, Oklahoma, Camp Lujo. I still believe in summer camps for young people. Then I was invited to go on a mission trip. Join MANA Project, and that has truly been life-changing. Sometimes these events happen near misses. You ever thought you was going to be in a wreck, and all of a sudden you came out of it, and there wasn't a wreck? Let me tell you the time when Karen and I were driving, and something happened, and our car did a complete 360 turn in the middle of the road, ended up on the side of the road, going in the direction we wanted to go, no damage, nothing hurt. That's life changing. Needless to say, didn't get sleepy on the rest of the way home. This afternoon, if you haven't heard, we bought land, we're going to do something with it, and hopefully move there sometime. I bought bees to get a discount from paying uh, county taxes. I worked those bees this afternoon. It's still real scary, even with a bee suit on. Those bees were everywhere on my mask. I barely could look out. It was so covered with bees. That could have been life-changing if they had gotten to my skin. Imagine anaphylactic shock. Life-changing. How about when Jesus comes into a person's life? When you learn about Jesus, you learn about His sacrifice, and you learn to live for Him. And every decision you make is based upon what does God want. The commandments of Jesus are not grievous. They're not burdensome. 
their life changing. I'd like to look at two events this evening in the life of Jesus. In some ways very similar, but one at the beginning of his life and one later on prior or after his death. There in Luke chapter 2, we read about the time when this married couple, of course, they've got a son, have gone to Jerusalem. It's a pilgrimage. Every family goes there to observe uh, the Passover. And there's responsibilities. And on the way, or after they got there, on the way back home, all of a sudden, they miss somebody. How could you lose a child? Uh, that's not changing. I remember our family leaving Ruth at the church building one Sunday. I don't know how we left her. There's just six of us. But sure enough, and I imagine every one of us can talk about the time when somebody was left. We thought Daddy got her. We thought Mama got her. And neither one of them, and they were able to find that child. But here in this very familiar story in Luke 15 of the prodigal son, Jesus made a very interesting statement when he said about this young man who had wasted his inheritance. That this young man came to his senses and he decided to go home. That prodigal son changed his course of action for the better when he changed his thinking about himself. And when we learn the, the truth about who we really are, it can be life changing. We're going to ask the question from time to time, who am I? What am I here for? It's difficult to, to estimate how powerfully we are affected by the way we think about ourselves, our self-concept, our self-worth, our personal identity. Are you a lady who wears all kinds of hats, mother, wife, co-worker, you know, citizen of the United States, on and on it goes? If we are to have any hope of quality, a quality relationship with God, we have to answer the question, who am I? So let's be serious about that question. Who are we really? Let's begin by looking at the time there in Luke 2. Did Jesus know about Himself? How early? When did He realize? Before that event? Luke creatively begins and ends the story of Jesus in, in the Gospel of Luke, telling, telling these similar stories. There's Mary and Mark, excuse me, Mary and Joseph traveling to Jerusalem. It takes three days. Imagine having left their son or wondered where, his, where he was. How emotionally distraught, how confused, how worried. The time I thought Lanny was kidnapped. I'll tell you what, that was the worst hour and a half I ever went through in my whole life. Imagine parents wondering where their child is. And when they found him, he was astounding the scribes and the leaders there at the temple with answers beyond the age of 12. And when Mary asked Jesus, why did you do this to us? And the question is answered by this young boy. Mother, did you not know I, it was necessary for, be, for me to be about my father's business to be in the father's house 
And it says that Mary treasured those words in her heart. Can you imagine how those words changed her life? Sometimes I wonder if there was any indication of this prior to this event. Did, did Jesus show Himself? Did He give hints of wisdom that caused Mary and Joseph to think, are you, are you this earth? Yes, it changed her life, didn't it? Then the other story this evening comes when Jesus is on the road to Emmaus. He's walking there with two disciples. And they, they don't know who it is. His identity is hid from them for a while. I wonder how their lives changed as their hearts burned within them. How different they must have been afterwards when He said to them, wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter into His glory? Something about that event that says within them something stirred. Jeremiah says, Woe unto me, lest I preach the gospel, the truth. There's within me, within my bones, a burning, a desire. It's like somebody who has uh, a tidbit, some gossip, and he's looking for somebody with ears to hear what I have to share. I wonder if social media is based on because of that give and take of facts and, and truth and different things. We read about Paul in Acts 17, verses 13, 32. It's called Mars Hill, the city of Athens. He's declaring the truth of the resurrection. And unfortunately, many of the lead hearers, listeners, of that sermon that he preaches. And he says, we're all of one blood. We're all uh, under one God. God has uh, given us life. And, and there's boundaries in all this. And while some might be curious, they were not seeking spiritual truth. But simply wanted to discuss the latest human doctrines and philosophies. They're curious. Paul what is it about you and the way? The group called Christians. What about you? Tell us about it. <coughs> and he did. And read the results at the end of Acts 17. How many converts? How many people changed? You know, in our technology world, we, we understand that too much information can be dangerous. I've heard it oft, often said... Uh, individual knows just enough to make it dangerous. <clears throat> the ancient Greek historian Plutarch warned of the danger of living on pure information level only when he wisely said, The mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be kindled. I wonder if he's read Jeremiah. I wonder if he's read Luke here, the story of the two on the road to Emmaus. These two followers on the road to Emmaus might agree with us. You see, they grieved the death of Jesus. They'd been there, they'd heard about it, and all of a sudden, their risen Lord joined them and hid identity, Luke 24, 16. And he began instructing them of the ancient prophecies of Old Testament which record the events of his very life and death. And later that day, Christ revealed himself to them and they departed, Luke 24, 31. And after Jesus left, those two talked among themselves 
And they marveled at what they'd heard, the things that he taught them. And they said, a fire was kindled in our hearts with devotion toward Jesus, Luke 24, 32. Imagine if this life-changing event could have been for us. Imagine walking on the road or riding on a bus with our Lord. You think he would his demonstration of, of the knowledge of life and wisdom and you think it would impress us? You think it'd change our mind if we had wrong feelings? Would it give us a new direction? I believe it would. So I wonder about me, and I wonder about you, about us together, how different would it be if we would treasure in our hearts that Jesus that walked on that road? How much would we change if our hearts burned within us over the news that Jesus is the solution to all problems of life? Don't we have the answers of life from Him? What if these episodes were intended to open our eyes to a fuller explanation of it all? And from the childhood story of Jesus to the road to Emmaus, these stories show us the meaning of our transformation from an old man, from an old person, to a new creature. He changes us. He shows us our mission. We must be about our Father's business, Luke 2. In real time. And in past time, we look at the law and the prophets and learn of the value of His coming to this earth. I wonder, would it be like scales falling off our eyes if that truth were known? Did it not happen to Paul there in Damascus when he believed? He was blind, but now he could see, both physically and spiritually. He learned that he was no longer wanting to persecute those of Jesus. But he came to understand Jesus was Lord. He'd been fighting against them. Yes, these life events changing us. May we continue to look for those things in God's wonderful book that's meant to make us better. To help us shine for Him. To give us a fire and enthusiasm for those around us. And they see within us a hope, a faith beyond this world. Oh, there's life-changing events, but there's nothing like the changed life, the reformed life of individuals who died to themselves, allow themselves to live and serve for Jesus Christ. That's you and me. It's a continual process even to the end of our very life on this earth. Won't heaven be worth it all? Because of these life-changing events from God's Word, from Christ being in us. If you have any need to change, to change something you know is wrong, what a great opportunity now to come and admit and ask for prayers. For forgiveness. There's a brother or sister that can help you. There's elders ready to talk with you. Come while we stand, while we sing.